essential about uh, just finding these periodic motions and, um, and energy dissipation? And the answer is there is not. Or in other words, is there a, a uh, lower bound on the energetic cost of walking? Like you think of rolling as a lower bound of zero, because if you have infinitely hard, round, smooth objects, it can roll with zero energy cost. Is it possible to walk with zero energy cost? And then this is a machine. This shows, at least in principle, in some in some way of thinking about it, uh, you can you can walk uh, with zero energy cost. And here's a computer simulation of that walking. It doesn't look like what a person does. I'm not claiming it's a model of what a person does. There's some blood. But the, so the idea, first of all, this is a it's a completely symmetric gait, forward and backwards, and actually and all going all the way through my talk. Almost all of the gates I showed you are very close to symmetric forwards and backwards. It's an interesting feature which we don't really understand, uh, that, they're, that they're so close to symmetric forwards and backwards. This one is exactly symmetric forwards and backwards. 
And what happens is just at this point, back in, there's a spring between this and this. And this leg, which is falling, is being lifted by this spring. So this thing, instead of colliding with the ground, hits the ground with zero velocity. And then you have to check that it hits the ground with zero velocity, but wants to continue through the ground and lift up. So it has to be a cubic kind of function. Height is a function of time that it's trying to do. So it touches the ground with zero velocity, and it continues the motion with no loss in energy. And that's why you get this periodic continued motion. Okay. Any questions about this? Spring between which bodies? Everybody. You can say there's a spring between here and here, and a spring between here and here. But not between this. It doesn't, it's sort of, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, yeah. Okay? There is no fuel, yeah? No fuel. This is walking on flat ground. Flat ground. But it's not stable. So this is about energetics in motion, not about stability in motion. And it's just showing there's no fundamental lower bound to the energetic cost of walking. By, it's proved by demonstration that there's no fundamental lower bound. So you think of walking as being essentially less efficient than rolling, but it doesn't have to be. Do you have a question? Uh, came to my mind that this is completely irrelevant or not related. You are worried about uh, the thing hitting the ground. That's correct. If you make the thing walk on a circle, like a little rat, maybe. Well, there, uh, squirrel. If you try, I, I mean, I like to I like to pose questions in mechanics that are fairly pure, for, fairly pure posed problems, so they're kind of mathematical. But if you try to get very mathematical about what is walking and what is rolling. It, you have to get, it, gets to, it starts to be very fussy about what is the shape of the foot, how big is the foot, are the legs or out of the foot. No, I'm just hitting the ground. The ground, instead of being flat, you make it so. Uh, perhaps there are solutions like this. We don't need that because we got what we wanted on the flat ground anyway. But, but the, the precise delineation between walking and rolling is you know, if you want to make the rules, it becomes very technical. Okay. Um, there are a couple more uh, passive dynamic ideas before I go on to the other. One is uh, trying to do passive dynamic brachiation. Brachiation is monkeys swinging from trees. Actually, they're called, they're apes, not monkeys, but that's for biologists to distinguish. Uh, if you Look at uh, uh, these, these uh, animals, they can swing from trees. And the question is, can you make a uh, passive model that has uh, some of these properties? And that's, and that's what we uh, worked on. So the simplest, well, what, one, one thing to show, this, this is a, a video I could have shown many times so far, but I just show it this time. This is now a model of a monkey. Here's the arms and the body and the legs. And we're interested, does this have passive dynamic locomotion? And all the videos I show you make it look like it's very easy, but it's only easy after you do the root finding to find the right initial conditions. So this is just showing you, if you don't find the right initial conditions, what does it look like? It doesn't look like passive dynamic locomotion. Now it turns out that in this case, uh, he never found good motions with this model, so we had to go back uh, to simpler models. So the simplest model that you can think of for this kind of thing is just a point mass, which goes back to the joke about the horse, assume a spherical horse, or you assume a point mass uh, monkey. And what you have is that here's the monkey swinging from his arm, and it's on a circular orbit following the pendulum equations, and then it lets go, and then it's an upside down parabola. And then you paste that parabola together with the pendulum. And you make sure that the motions are tangent. And here we have a periodic motion that looks something like what a monkey does. And it's, it's, in some ways it's similar. If, if you look at the forces that are generated by a real monkey, it's not, it's, uh, not so different from that. And then here's a, a more complicated model. Uh, this has sophisticated arms but not yet uh, sophisticated legs. This is as far as we got in radiation, but this is uh, showing this periodic motion uh, 
And this is not quite technically passive dynamic because there's no energy going into the system. And this is going on level ground. Uh, the equations are conservative, Hamiltonian, polynomial, and everything here. Then it makes contact, but we need the contact to hold on. So it takes, it takes a mechanism. In principle, the mechanism could have arbitrarily small cost because it does no work, it just holds on. But we need a mechanism that holds on and then lets go. And then one thing you can see about the solution is these periodic motions. Maybe it's not surprising in this case is that they are, they are symmetric forwards and backwards. And they have always these symmetric configurations like this. Uh, but again, this shows not about stability. This thing cannot be stable because it's conservative and because it is right next to a solution that has a collision, a small perturbation would put it in a collision that has to be unstable. But it, but it shows that something like animal motion has, before you worry about stability, can be accomplished in a passive way, which is uh, takes little or no energy. Okay, then I have my last example, which is a, 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 a guy, uh, a guy who designs optical equipment, reads a science magazine, and he read one of our papers, and he said, uh, I've become interested in your, in your designs. Well, my wife says, I've become obsessed with your designs. And, and, she, uh, and he has this whole library of new passive dynamic machines that he had invented. And you can go to his uh, website, and he has several of them on his website. Beautiful machines that go downhill in very funny, slow, beautiful ways. He said, is there anything I could do that would be interesting for scientists? And I said, well, we made a walking machine that can balance when it's moving, but it can't balance uh, when it's standing. Can you make a running or a hopping machine that can hop downhill, but if I try to stand it up, it will, it will fall down? And he took that challenge, and, uh, and here's what he came up with. He came up with this, uh, this beautiful uh, machine. And here's uh, his basement in Oregon. And, oh, sorry, it's the wrong, oh, I don't want to show you that video yet. Is he a layman or is a scientist? He has a bachelor's degree and he's a technician. He designs technician. He, he, has a, he, he works for a hospital designing optical equipment. And he has a, that's what he, he's, but he's very good. Here's a, a slow motion video of uh, his, uh, of his hopper. Um, so we, we, we took this to my lab. We, uh, we, made, we did motion capture with, uh, with uh, reflectors and 3D cameras. Uh, two different students made, made uh, models of this with rigid bodies and springs. Uh, we can put it on a ramp, which is five meters long. And over and over again, it will hop 100 or 110 times, pop, 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 pop down the ramp from one end to the other without falling down. It's got these very small feet. It's nowhere close to being able to stand up. And, and I think the video is beautiful, but a friend of mine, uh, Professor Wang at Cornell, when I showed her one of these videos, and I said, don't you think this is beautiful? She said, Andy, everything is beautiful at 500 frames per second. Which is, I think, true. Uh, any questions about this robot? So many questions. <laughs> well, let, let me just tell you, remember that my student made that Tinker toy, and it took us two years for the computer to agree that there was some object in the neighborhood of that physical object that had all eigenvalues with less than one in magnitude. So the computer said 1.1. We watched the machine, it didn't fall down. Uh, if it's going to be unstable, you expect exponential growth. It should, you should not be able to make a demonstration of an unstable machine. So we had persistence, and we spent two years, and then we got a machine like that to get eigenvalues of like 0.9, less than one. Now I had two different students, almost always, by the way, I had two students do the models, 
They write the equations different ways, they simulate them different ways, and we compare almost always they don't agree. The, the classic story is they come together, they don't agree, and then they come back a week later and each of them says, I found my mistake. <laughs> but eventually they converge. I have two different students work on simulating this. They not only wrote the equations differently, they use a slightly different model. There's a spring in here, and there's some choices about how you model the spring, whether it's a beam that's anchored at one end or a beam that's anchored at the other end. And, and uh, they had slightly different models, but they eventually got their solutions to converge to each other for, for a certain you know, special test cases. And neither of them could get the eigenvalues less than one. They could get them down to 1.01, but not less than one. And then they really worked, both of them worked hard, never to get less than one. And now the current, the, our current thought about this is that in an experiment, the difference between 0.99 and 1.01 .01 is not something you can see anyway. So this is taking about 100 steps. If you have an eigenvalue of 1.01, .01, you raise that to the 100th power. Disturbances are getting multiplied. 1.01 .01 to the 100th power is, math quiz, 1.01 to the 100th power. Uh, 1.01. What? 1.01. 1 1.01. 1 .01 Do you know? Freshman calculus teachers, it's 1 plus 1 over n to the nth power, then it goes to infinity e. Uh, so it gets multiplied by 2.7, approximately, uh, or decayed by 2.7, but who knows how big the disturbances are at the beginning. So in the experiment, maybe we wouldn't know the difference between 0.99 and 1.01. On top of that, if you watch Peter Stein can't launch this thing, or anybody in the lab who launches it, this one, it turns out, is very reliable, more reliable than the other one was. There's some way that people hold it at the beginning. And what we now think is that people learn a way of holding this, which changes the dynamics, which makes the holding dynamics attractive onto the limit cycle that eventually it wants to be on when you let go. So you launch it by holding it, it goes da 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 You find the limit cycle somehow by feel, then you let go, and then you have a very small, it's not a random perturbation because you homed in on the limit cycle, and then it goes 100 hops down the ramp without falling down. So it, it, in some sense, I think he failed to find a, um, a uh, statically unstable, dynamically stable system. It, we think it's dynamically unstable, but it's so close that it's sort of experimentally uh, indistinguishable. Now, this guy, I think, um, I guess like lots of people who do not go into academics, is some kind of genius. And if you have that kind of brain, and you say, what kind of thing is a hopping robot? So if you have this kind of mind, when you are unpacking a refrigerator, <laughs> you see the trash, and you say, maybe that's a hopping robot. So he took a piece of foam. <laughs> from the box that his refrigerator came in, and he put it on a ramp. <laughs> so in terms of how simple can these things get, I think this gets some kind of prize. It's just one block of styrofoam, and that's all. That's a passive dynamic robot. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to go on to the power ideas about power and so on. Any questions about the passive dynamics? You said you have so many questions. Do you want to ask one of them? Oh, it's, it's a, it's a looks like some you <laughs> no, it looks like the, well, the, the, um, the line the fishing line you cannot see the lines to the ceiling the fishing lines that connect to the ceiling are hard to see in the video yeah. <laughs> just kidding. that's a joke okay, <laughs> okay so uh, part two is, uh, is uh, trying to avoid talking about control from the other side. And the other side is assuming that nerves do a perfect job. 
and that you have control, and you and you have and, the, and you control anything you want. You don't have to worry about the details of the control. Uh, this point of view is maybe based on the idea that we've been evolving for four billion years, and nature is very smart. Evolution is a very good system, and it probably does the things it's trying to do very well. And it's maybe not a bad model to think that it does it perfectly. Therefore, you idealize the behavior as being optimal something. Now, if you go to this sort of inverse optimization point of view, uh, in a way you're doomed to failure, and this is again a freshman calculus exercise. If you say there's some performance that you're trying to optimize, and there's some parameter you're looking at, and the performance is a function of the parameter, the nature of the optimum is that it's when the first derivative is zero. The first derivative of zero means that you're insensitive to parameter changes. It means very small changes in the, in the model or very small surrendering of the objective function, maybe you're trying to do two things at once, can have big changes in the parameters. So it's not really a fair test of an optimization model to take the model, look down at the parameters at the optimum value, and see whether you see that in nature. The fair test is to take an optimum value look at the value you get of the optimum and compare that to the natural solution and make sure that the set of what you think is the natural solution, some parameter value down here, has performance which is close to the optimum. But the strict inverse optimization saying this is the optimum behavior, therefore we expect to see this, is doomed to failure because of calculus, freshman calculus. For Russia, it's probably high school calculus. Okay, so here's a, a, a talk. I apologize for um, for showing a, a, a talk that was prepared elsewhere so that the slides don't quite match. Um, no, Srinivasan is not here because he wasn't invited, not because of his problems. He could have invited him. Smart, nice guy. Uh, so there's a, a, a Monty Hall skit called uh, The Ministry of Silly Walks. Uh, I think I'm short of time, so I, I'm not going to show this video of the silly walks. But the idea is that there are all kinds of ways you can walk. Why do you walk the way that you do walk? There are all kinds of ways you could run. Why do you run the ways that you do run? In fact, when you're going fast, why do you run? And when you're going slow, why do you walk? So the simple question is, if you're in a hurry to go someplace, should you walk or run? you would say run. If you're not in a hurry, should you walk around, you would say walk. And then you say why. So uh, Minos uh, did this calculation, which is, again, the spherical horse is too complicated. So assume a point mass person. And this point mass person interacts with the ground with extendable legs. One way to look at your legs is that they're kind of light. And even though it's a whole mechanism, the main thing this mechanism does is it transmits the force from your hip to your toe. So you can just replace it with a force along here. So assume that you have legs which transmit a force. Uh, maybe you have two legs on the ground at once or not. And that the, the price you pay for using this force is the work that this force does. We're going to be looking at periodic motions. We are going to have no technical collisions. Therefore, the network is always going to be zero. So we make the assumption that the muscles have a property that they do not regenerate work. That is, if you walk down a long staircase, you don't say, boy, do I feel peppy now. You're, in fact, a little bit tired. You don't get the energy back from negative work in muscles. So we assume that there's a price to be paid for positive work and no reward for negative work. The way the calculations go, it doesn't matter whether you put no reward, small price, large price, the calculation comes out. Because the system is conservative, not in the Hamiltonian sense, but in the sense that the work, the network is zero, uh, it doesn't matter what penalty you put on the negative work, you, you have the same optimization problem. So the question is, if you have legs like this, you want to move this mass, what's the best way to do it to minimize work? So this is an optimal control calculation. And, uh, uh, what are the equations that go into this? <laughs> Versions of this, but it's much simpler. Uh, in the flight phase, you just have ballistics. If the leg is touching the ground, you have uh, a force 
uh, which, which pushes on this mass in the x and y direction. Uh, you do the optimal control calculation. What you're trying to do is select from all of these crazy ways you could walk and run. And uh, by minimizing this uh, work term, and the plus means you count it if it's positive, you don't count it if it's negative. And if you do that optimization, what you find out is that you can reduce the cost to zero by taking infinitely fast, infinitely small steps. So to make this more realistic, we could put in a penalty for swinging the legs, but rather than do that, the simpler way to do it is to add a constraint to the optimization, and the constraint is, is that the step length is fixed. So now we want to walk at a given speed, fixed, at a given step length, and now we want to pick whether we should walk or run or how we should walk or run. What we find out is that depending on what the speed is that you're trying to go and what the step length is, there are three different gates. One of them is exactly what people call ideal running, a bouncing gate. One of them is exactly what pe people use as the idealization of walking and then we're dependent on walking. And one of them is a gate which seems like has not been seen in nature. There's some kind of funny cross between walking and running, which I can describe to you. Uh, we actually spent some time looking to see if people in funny situations would do this, and, and maybe we found one case, and maybe we didn't. And so we get these, uh, the optimization is this optimal control calculation. The solution is actually singular, so it's not really fair to ask the smooth uh, uh, programs to do the singular calculation, but the way we do it is we, we uh, put on constraints on the maximum force, and that gives a smooth solution, and then we, make, we raise the constraint higher and higher, and as we raise the constraint higher and higher, the solution gets closer and closer to an impulsive solution. And it's this funny impulsive solution that here's the walking gate, you get exactly a pendular motion, which is no work involved. Just before this foot is going to hit the ground, you have an impulsive push-off, then you have an impulsive collision. Neither of these are technically impulses. They're big forces that are arbitrarily large as we sort of make the mesh finer and finer. Uh, and then on it goes. This preemptive push-off, where you push off before a heel strike, is something that you can see that you do when you are walking. It's uh, something that we had actually discovered by more simple calculations, sort of collisional calculations. And I don't know if this is something that Bromowski discovered or not. This would be an interesting thing. This is sort of one of the victories of the collisional theory, and Formowski's theories are all impulsive theories, that the optimal energetic thing to do is to have an impulsive push-off just before the heel strike collision. Does anybody know Formowski's work in enough detail to know that? So this was kind of a major discovery, actually, and uh, I don't know if uh, we were preempted on that or not. Uh, then the running gate uh, gives us bounce, uh, what's interesting in this calculation is classically in biomechanics, people describe walking as something where energy is exchanged between kinetic and potential energy, and in running, where energy is exchanged between kinetic energy and spring potential energy. This calculation has no spring in it. So what we find is that running is beneficial at high speeds, even without any elastic recovery. And I think this is biologically significant because when we were created as runners, our bodies were not created with good springs in our legs, and then we learned how to use them. Rather, we, it must have been that it was beneficial to run, and then the spring entered over evolutionary time to improve the efficiency. And this, and this is, a, I think, the first calculation to show that energy, that running is, a, is beneficial even without springs. Uh, and, then, and then here's this funny pendular running gait. Uh, sometimes people like to think that the idea of lighted locomotion is that the motion should be smooth. So you can compare these solutions to smooth motions where you use the legs in such a way that you go in a straight line at constant speed, or maybe not at constant speed. All of those motions require more work than these collisional motions. Okay, so have, here's the uh, conclusion is that uh, bouncing is good, even if you uh, don't have springs, and if you're in a hurry, an important theoretical result, you should run. And if you're not in a hurry, you should walk. In case you didn't know that before. Any questions about that calculation? What's the rate of deficiency? What? The 
What are the differences in cost? Uh, I say this is a, a dissatisfying feature of this model. I don't remember the exact numbers, uh, but they're, they're, you know, you can make the cost as high as you want by doing really crazy things. But the diff if you walk when you should run and run when you should walk, it's, I don't remember, but it's 10, 20, 30 percent different. It's not, it's not, it's not wildly different. Does that answer your question? Um, once you discover that the optimal solutions tend to be collisional, you can then do collisional or impulsive. You can do collisional calculations from the beginning. And I think I'm sort of short on time, so I'm not going to show you this. But what you find out is that if you assume collisions from the beginning, you can look at a subset of the previous motions and then do pencil and paper calculations. And with those pencil and paper calculations, you, you get uh, the, the same results I described before. Do I have time to show two more videos? Uh, show me that shot video, Coach. What? How long are they here? As long as you want. My <laughs> own. <laughs> Uh, let me just go, let me just do the videos. Okay, I'm not going to tell us. I'll just tell the story as long as the videos go. Uh, this is uh, taking a passive robot and adding power to it. Remember the Wright brothers' story? They had a glider, they had a power. So this is Steve Collins, the same student. He added power. The nature of the power that was added is there's a switch here. When that switch get, when that switch is triggered, it releases a spring which extends this ankle and it does a little push off. It's not preemptive, but it's a push off nonetheless. That's what powers this machine. So it's got very little feedback, one bit per step, with a timing accuracy of maybe seven bits. And this uh, is now walking on level ground. So this, until a year ago, this was the most energy effective walking robot. It had a cost of transport of about 0 0.2 which means the power used divided by the weight times velocity is about 0.2, which is a little better than a human being. And can that be uh, sold on tennis shoes? Uh, can that what? Put on tennis shoes and a little gadget to it. This, so here's, I tried to allude to this before. This video is, is really completely dishonest. So I can show this video and say, this is typical motion of this robot, but it's not. This is every time this robot works. I have 10 more hours of video of this robot falling down. <laughs> so what we took is all of the bad things about passive dynamics, these eigenvalues that were about 0.7, this extreme sensitivity to parameters, and we inherited all that when we added motors. So, yes? How do you control a robot? How do you the thing inside? This robot has one bit of feedback per second. One bit. It has a switch. When that switch goes, the foot pushes. That's, you say, where does the stability come from? The stability comes from the same places as the passive dynamic robots. So, uh, actually, if there's something external, so very small, the two of us uh, move it away from the human cycle, that the Russian controller well, let, let me give an example of such a disturbance. Steve Collins moved to Michigan, and the robot didn't walk anymore. Steve Collins moved to Michigan, and the robot, that was a big enough disturbance. The robot was emotionally upset, I don't know. It didn't like it, it did not walk anymore, ever again. Not one more time, ever. I paid for Steve Collins to come back, on the airplane for the plane ticket, he came back, the robot said, nothing doing, I'm finished. <laughs> Never walk again. Okay. Uh, so, the, the, here's, here's the thing. So the, the Wright brothers analogy that I lived by for 15 years, I think is completely wrong. So the thing I started my talk with, I think is completely wrong. So, the Wright brothers, had gliders and then power, but then if you actually pay attention to what the Wright brothers said, it wasn't about gliders and power. It was about mastering control before you worried about engines. So when they had their gliders, they actually did not have passive gliders. They were controlling them. They were training the pilots. They were learning how to fly. They were learning how to adjust the wires. They were learning how to adjust the ailerons. They were learning the control surfaces in back and front. They learned the control system, and then they added the motor. A very different lesson.
So now, when we make a robot, we're trying to do the same thing. And this is really the, the last, the last uh, video. So we have um, this robot, which instead of getting one bit of feedback per second, gets about 100,000 bytes of feedback per second. Instead of running a computer program, which is equivalent to a few switches, it's running about 20,000 lines of code. Instead of one computer that costs $2, we have six processors running at a megahertz. So we've gone completely to the other extreme, trying to master control. And now the price we pay for that is the robot is much less interesting. Uh, but we now have a robot which is not so sensitive. So we can walk around. Uh, here it is at a raising money for cancer. Uh, we, this was a practice on the cancer walk before practicing. And the next day, it walked 65 kilometers without being touched by a human being. And it walked with a little less energy use than the Collins robot before. So over 40 miles without being touched in each other. And this is now by switching out the the uh, uh, how this robot is controlled. How will we get the stability? Okay, so this robot, remember, it has 25 sensors on it. We're collecting one byte or two mm -hmm. bytes of data from each sensor every millisecond. And we have six computers processing this. We're doing a state estimation of the robot. Uh, we're looking at the state all the time, and we're putting in corrections for where the light goes, for how far it pushes off. The basic actuation of the control is how hard do you push off, depending on the state, and how hard and where do you where do you put the foot down at the next step. Those are the basic actuation modes, but the calculation we have a big calculation into that stability. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So let's say thank you to the doctor.